Hello, and welcome to today's episode of Scurf Interviews in a bit of a non-traditional one. We're uh, changing our structure from just highlighting what research is taking place, bringing together industry practitioners and academics, to uh, taking a, some time to actually discuss what Scurf is all about. And we figured what better way to do that than uh, me having a conversation with our co-founder and leader, Richard Brown. So I guess just to get us kicked off, Rich, do you want to do a, a quick little intro before we start chatting Scurf? Uh, sure, I would be happy to. Um, I always stumble on these things because I don't know how far back to go and I don't want to date myself, but here we go. Um, I'm kind of an early adopter. I got into web development around 1994, um, heavily involved in the web 2.0 space for a long, long time. Uh, did, uh, was involved with a lot of startups, a lot of large, uh, also involved with a lot of larger organizations, uh, helping out with the IT side and the web development side. Um, went through that uh, ringer for a decade or two. Uh, became uh, more and more interested in um, the notion of what tech startups were all about and what were they trying to achieve and how were they speaking to their constituents and what kind of value were people deriving from these things versus the value that they were putting into them and found that I didn't like some of the answers I was coming uh, coming up with. And so I became uh, more and more interested in the co-op space. Um, there was a burgeoning movement in the early 2000s uh, around sustainability and how do we ensure that people that are uh, providing value to an organization are seeing a uh, commensurate value coming back to them. Um, and how do they get uh, some agency in the decision-making process? And uh, is it possible to have a worker-owned technology company or startup? Uh, we, a group of uh, peers and I were very interested in that question. We started an organization called Stocksy United to explore that, which is a stock photography co-op uh, on the internet. And we had 1,500 photographers uh, getting, uh, providing value to the organization, but also receiving vast majority of that value right back out again. Uh, that was a really fun experiment, did that for a few years, and around that time, uh, I was sort of radicalized into the Ethereum space, and so um, watched a few YouTube videos from Andreas Antonopoulos and went down the rabbit hole, um, became absolutely obsessed with this notion that uh, for the first time uh, that I'm aware of, uh, tooling existed that allowed the implementation of some of these things that I was very interested in with uh, community building, uh, collective uh, organization, governance, um, a collective ownership of organizations. All of these things uh, were suddenly made possible through um, uh, clever application of incentives and smart contracts. And I went down that rabbit hole very deeply, uh, discovered an organization that was just sort of coming into its own called MakerDAO, uh, joined them, uh, became the head of community at MakerDAO uh, and had the opportunity to watch that organization go from uh, people hanging out in a team speak to the behemoth that it eventually became uh, three years later. Uh, and also that gave me sort of a front row seat to start answering some questions at the beginning of this DAO journey that we all seem to be uh, very interested in these days. How do you um, create frameworks and how do you create grant uh, for people to derive value and contribute value to the protocol? How do you coordinate large groups of, uh, of aligned actors on the internet together? Um, how do you ensure that they're receiving value from the protocol as well as contributing value to the protocol? How do you set up grants programs? How do you govern collectively? Uh, a lot of these questions were brand new uh, when we were thinking about them at Maker and so we came up with things like hey, we should maybe we have a forum or what if we had weekly calls where we talked about governance what if there's some way that people could vote on stuff and so uh, it was exciting to be part of that, that that early journey that all uh led up to present day i, guess, I suppose where um after i left maker i uh, had some conversations and um landed on this notion of taking all the things that we sort of learned there uh, with building communities and applying it to some more uh, broadly applicable uh challenges that the Web3 space faces in general. And that's how Scurf sort of came about, or the, the germination of it. Yeah, and that's sort of a, a perfect transition into, I know, something that uh, Chris from our team wanted to, to hear us chat about a little bit, uh, which was sort of what was the original uh, idea or the original impetus that spawned what became Scurf? That is a great question, and I can always count on Chris to come up with great questions. And so how, this is how it got kicked off. Um, after uh, I left uh, Maker, 
uh, had about a week and a half to take a deep breath, consider uh, playing some video games before I uh, started having some conversations with Sergei Nazarov from Chainlink. Um, Sergei and I had chatted previously about uh, community and the importance of community. Um, when he found out that I was a free agent, we got together to discuss what comes next. And so we tossed around a lot of ideas. We had a lot of conversations about what um, kind of opportunities the space presented, what kind of challenges the space uh, was experiencing, and how um, we could create something that would solve some of those. And as we were running through our laundry list of um, challenges, uh, we both sort of aligned on this same notion, and it's something that's been bothering him for a long time. Uh, Sergey is very academically focused, and, and Chainlink as an organization has a deep research uh, culture. I, uh, through granting programs and through working uh, with uh, early, early stage projects, trying to help get them bootstrapped, uh, was constantly sort of confused about uh, this challenge of, is there research out there? Is there institutional knowledge in other organizations? Is there, uh, are, are there places where where industry can go to find out whether has this been tried before? Or what can we learn from the people who have gone before us? So when I ask teams, have you done the research? Um, generally, the answer was no, and we don't know how. And th those are all um, legitimate responses because I've been through a lot of startups myself. And when I look back in my history, there's been plenty of time where I thought to myself, well, this is interesting. We're going to try something here. But it's my suspicion that it's been tried before, or at least somebody's thought about it. If only there was some way that I could go to the source of all this wisdom. If I go to academia, if I go to these these think tanks, if I could go to researchers and have some way to find out, is the thing that industry is attempting, has that been thought about in, in academia? Um, so how do we connect industry and academia together? So there's a reciprocal relationship. And obviously, this is connecting industry and academia is a phrase. It's a, It's well-worn. People have been thinking about this for a long time, but it sort of loops back to my previous you know, aha moments where maybe in this brave new blockchain world that we live in, this Web3 world, maybe that the primitives exist that create some alignments between these two groups where we can actually put some things into practice, incentivize them, and then reward people for meritorious actions. And so uh, this this is sort of where Scurf was was born. How do we take the data and the challenges and the use case and the experience of industry in all of these domains in the crypto space and match them up with um, ethnographers and linguists and uh, si political scientists and sociologists and uh, privacy researchers. There's institutional knowledge in academia that needs to be tapped and there's data and research uh, and, and results in industry that need to be tapped as well. And so SCURF was sort of born out of that notion that we need to uh, facilitate this connection between these two great peoples and figure out what comes what comes out of that and how can we support it. Yeah, and I wonder, because, you know, obviously on the surface of it, MakerDAO was one of the first, uh, I guess, in, in modern parlance of DeFi projects uh, before DeFi was a, a term that was slung around actively. Meanwhile, SCURF is much more of a nonprofit effort in supporting research how different was the process of starting community in one versus the other? Um, that there was a surprising number of alignments, actually. So in crypto, we're general. Well, I'm speaking for the rest of crypto here, so I'm sure I could be uh, convinced or argued with. But uh, there isn't a lot of revenue pressures in the crypto world. We we live in a very uh, opportunity rich environment. It probably won't always be this way, but it is now. And so um, there's still this. Uh, crypto anarchic egalitarian sort of uh, co kind of co op -y model uh, throughout crypto where we have the table is big enough that we can all uh, step up to the buffet and there isn't a lot of competition there isn't a lot of revenues pressure and so even with these these larger protocols the environment is uh, more collaborative and supportive uh, than it would be in a traditional business and so there isn't a, a ton of difference between the two and partially, I, I wanted to craft the community ecosystem at Maker as being slightly decoupled. So it's an add-on to the protocol, not a core part of the actual foundation. And so the work that we did was um, very sort of 
uh, community-based in order to create a, a vibrant environment that ended up supporting that protocol. And so a lot of those mechanisms translate very effectively into uh, an organization whose mandate is 100% altruistic and, and doesn't an agnostic and doesn't have uh, revenue pressures that lead us down one path or the other. Yeah, and so if I, if I remember correctly, the forum itself kind of went up a, a bit over a year ago. I think it was in January, late January, early February 2021. Uh, the forum started rolling out, and I know there was kind of an initial team around it and community that, that you and some others had already started building. And now it's sort of a just a, a year past that mark. I know I only started working part-time here in April last year and came on full-time last summer. But what do you see as kind of some of the uh, the things that you were most excited to see given this first year? Or progress. Yeah, that's a that's another interesting question. Um, so when we're so let's let's go back to the initial prem, the initial premise of SCURF is let's connect the industry and academia together, and so that is a lofty goal that that leads to the next question immediately. Well, at least the first question I would ask if somebody presented it to me is okay, but how? Um, and so it's the okay, but how part, which I think is most fascinating, and the way that. We're doing that how is through a series of experiments. We need to figure out what works. We need to figure out what our stakeholders are looking for, what the ecosystem uh, is interested in, and you know, match that up with some of our assumptions about where the ecosystem might be going. Once we have a sense of all these things, then we can begin to make some programs and connect the right individuals together and do some experiments. And the key here is it's an experimentation process. That's the part that I find most fascinating is engaging with the community and the people that have been attracted to the the mission of SCURF and uh, listening to the ideas that people come up with. So um, how do we uh, get information from demographics that traditionally be, traditionally have been left out of this sort of uh, North American centric crypto world that we tend to live in? So uh, regional grants has been a fascinating one for me. So let's take a look at Latin America, or let's take a look at uh, Southeast Asia, let's take a look at West Africa, and let's try to make some inroads to find out what are people doing there with blockchain, and then get some of that information and bring it back to the rest of the ecosystem. That's been a fascinating journey. Um, the process of uh, discovering a, a novel and actionable research in the Web3 space and figuring out some of the challenges around uh, what we've been calling it the last mile challenges. So how do we take uh, this uh, innovative research, this usable research, um, this novel research that exists in academia and A, find it, B, talk to the people that wrote it, C, figure out how we can reduce some of the frictions of making it more discoverable and accessible to industry. So what are the challenges there? So this comes back to the experimentation part where we have a, a we have a problem statement, but we don't necessarily know what the source of those problems are. And so discovering what are the friction points between industry and academia and how do we connect them together? And once we do connect them, what are they looking for? And what are the requirements around this content? Uh, those are the things that I find most fascinating. And, and we've, we've done a lot of really interesting things, watching the community researchers and academics and industry interact with, with each other on the forum is, is a process of discovering what those requirements are. And that's, that's also been uh, super rewarding for me to watch. Yeah, absolutely. And I know I can just mention from my perspective, because I, when I started uh, uh, first dabbling with SCURF, I was still working at Carnegie Mellon University at the time and working in that kind of environment. You know, I can very much vouch for the whole idea of, oh, connect industry and academia, uh, not being the most novel mission at its at its surface level. And I even jokingly kind of say, especially when I talk to academics of like, oh, well, we're here to connect industry and academia. I'm sure you've never heard that one before. And that always gets a good chuckle out of them because they're like, yeah, we, we we get that there's a lot of people playing that game. And the thing that attracted me to SCURF, aside from getting to work with some awesome folks, yourself included, uh, was the experimentation angle and the fact that like, hey, we're not pretending we know the answer here, but we are actively ready to experiment and figure out what can actually drive the most value and try to let it come out of a, a series and a, a landscape of experimentation. Yeah, it's the intention. It's a noble intention. Um, and it's this also speaks to the one of the core philosophies of SCURF is that we're not here to uh, tell people what the truth is. We're not here to discover the path to the truth. We're here to facilitate actors in the space that are working towards these things. And so how do we find uh, other organizations that are attempting to solve uh, the 
uh, how do you publish research in a, in a way that's likely to be read? So let's let's talk to those people and let's find out what they need and let's find out how we can collaborate. How do we uh, fund uh, original research? That's that's not a new question. Uh, people have been experimenting with this uh, for a long time. How do we do it in a way that speaks to uh, a the crypto space that we're trying to support, and how do we speak to the academics that are crypto curious and the crypto people that are research curious and, and aligned or inclined to interact with each other and how do we facilitate that stuff so we, we have the problem statement the actual rubric is something that we're still experimenting with it's, it's been a fascinating journey yeah and i guess just to, to to plug another project that's doing cool things in that realm of just experimenting with how to give out uh, funding to researchers i know experiment foundation is about to uh, run an experiment where i think they got roughly a half million dollars in the hand of scientists to fund different science projects and uh, it's cool that there's these sort of pockets of experimentation and i think uh, kind of segueing to where is scurf today and what are we all about at the moment you know thinking of how to be that coordination and facilitation layer across the different areas of activity where we can experiment of how to add value. Uh, I think that'll also segue into what I'm sure we'll touch on DSI in a little bit, but uh, just in general thinking of how do we not just reinvent the wheel, as you were saying, when you first forayed into, into the space overall, but how can we actually intentionally try to fill the gaps that are present in the landscape? Um, and I guess on that note, how, how do you currently think about overviewing what SCURF is? You know, like whenever you have to give an elevator pitch of SCURF, like how do you position it in terms of what we're up to here? This this is where it gets a little uh, circular, I suppose, but in a pleasing way. And so I, I have a bad tendency of saying like the number one job of SCURF and, or at the core uh, uh, output of SCURF, and then I change it on a week to week basis. And I'm going to continue that trend because it amuses me. But um, one, one of the core principles of SCURF is also to be reactionary. So we were uh, catering to and supporting the requirements of the crypto space. Um, and anybody familiar with that crypto space knows that it is uh, tremendously dynamic. It changes month to month, year to year. Uh, last year is almost unrecognizable. We have to stay on top of trends. And this when SCURF started out, we had sort of this this uh, sort of a narrow vision. How do we connect industry and academia together? Let's find good research. Let's summarize it. Let's uh, broadcast that information. Let's engage with the researchers, and then let's talk to academic or industry, and then begin that reciprocal process. But happily, uh, and this is part of the, uh, the oppor or opportunity rich environment I was talking about earlier, is that. Um, the crypto space has evolved rapidly all around us, and we're seeing emergent uh, subcultures and groups of individuals that are also highly focused on the research space and the academic space and all the rest of it. And so, uh, happily, our our scope has expanded to sort of uh, welcome those other groups in, and and also for have us join them as well. And so, you've already um, you already mentioned D side. This is uh, a, a great example of. Um, parallel discovery, I think, where we had our original mission and it turns out that uh, academics, industry, think tanks, uh, publishers, they're having these same uh, realizations that the world is ready for some additional alternatives. And so perhaps uh, there's tooling available in the crypto world, there's paradigms, there's actors that are interested in solving for the same sort of generalized problems is, as SCURF is. And so it's become a far more vibrant space in the last six to eight months than uh, we'd ever imagined when we started it. Absolutely. And I guess to, to dive into a little bit of where, where, do, where things do stand today on the SCURF side, uh, you know, we kind of as already mentioned, even in the name Smart Contract Research Forum, the forum and what we do on there is uh, very much at the core of kind of who we are and what we're about in order uh, to be able to facilitate those long-term conversations, to incentivize folks to make their research more accessible, uh, and to actually have both community and wider engagement around these research ideas as the starting point for us to find the right homes for it and the right connections on the industry side, and to always be thinking of how do we share the research ideas and in, in digestible ways and how do we get it connected to folks who actually need those ideas. And I guess just using that as a starting off point to think about the, the five verticals, or at least as we keep breaking it down of the, the five sort of parts of SCURF so far, uh, do you mind kind of filling in the gaps there and, and what you see as the other core parts of it beyond just the forum itself? 
Um, yeah, that's well, I might turn this question back on to you because this is an interesting dynamic we have where you're interviewing me, but you're also a critically uh, important part of this group. Uh, uh, machine. So uh, I would like to hear your opinions as well. But as we're trying to formalize the ways in which we can support the ecosystem and how do we find the actors that need to speak to uh, on one side of our demographics, the other side of our demographics, so the industry and academia, how do we connect them together? How do we begin to discover what it is that they require? How do we begin to, uh, how do we continue, I should say, to find uh, whether somebody else in the space is providing those needs or whether we can help facilitate those things? It's uh, the, the number of combinations that you can draw between all of these different stakeholders is uh, is a, a little daunting. So um, w the way that we're sort of framing these things is we have internally at SCURF, we have um, sort of divided our efforts up into a few different categories. And those categories are um, one big uh, grouping is around content. So obviously when we're trying to figure out this or identify this information and connect these individuals together, they're going to produce some kind of output. And it's critically important to this organization that as we get those outputs, we release them back into the commons in a way that they're likely to be discovered and uh, engaged with. So we have a lot of initiatives around uh, locating uh, good research, um, promoting that good research, um, distilling that good research into uh, formats that are likely to be ingested by uh, extremely busy uh, industry participants. Um, that content uh, grouping speaks directly to the next sort of uh, area of expertise that we like to we're trying to bring to the table, and that is around engagement. And so, um, generating content but having it uh, reside in a in a lonely GitHub or a dusty old filing cabinet or uh, some PDF in somebody's uh, personal computer doesn't do a lot of people very much good. So the, one of the key components of discovering this uh, useful and innovative research is ensuring that we bring it to the ecosystem and, and facilitate some engagement around it. So how do we uh, craft a conversation that is uh, likely to uh, produce uh, uh, results, having peers interact with this information and contributing to the value of it and doing some constructive criticism in hopefully a civil and uh, if not polite manner that encourages other actors to come into the system and begin uh, uh, debating the merits of uh, the content that we're finding. The third step here is that we want to ensure that um, once these engagements and uh, improvements or additions to the research that we're finding or the, the inputs that are industry might be bringing to us, how do we ensure that other people are made aware of these things? And so this is another piece of the puzzle where I frequently, well, I just, we were just at East Denver and I'm, maybe I'm going to be dating this interview a bit, but I think that this is a commonality. So uh, it's universal. Um, I was talking to numerous teams about their projects and what it is about their projects that were novel from a research perspective. What, what did you invent? that the rest of the ecosystem should know about and how can we get the ecosystem excited about this technology so maybe they can use it as well. And it became obvious to me that as I was going down this line of tables that literally the people at this table here should have been talking to the people two tables over, but they had no idea what those people were actually up to. And so this is one of the core problems we need to solve. So as we uh, distill their, their research and their content into uh, uh, sort of actionable or digestible pieces, and then we uh, bring that into a forum or a platform where it can be engaged with. How do we handle the discovery of that content? This is another major initiative of ours is um, that we sort of roll this thing up, and I, I'm not sure whether I said this, but it's the last mile problem for, for research. So um, creating the research is great. The last mile is uh, interacting with it, uh, letting people know that it exists and ensuring that it is being used. And so the content engagement discovery, uh, all these components go together to hopefully solve some of that problem. And within all those buckets, we have the, the experimentation that we were talking about earlier. So what projects, what kind of grants programs, what kind of frameworks do we apply to each one to sort of incentivize the ecosystem to engage with us? 
Yeah, and then we obviously have some activities. So starting with content at kind of the center and very much at the at the center of our universe here in terms of the the forum. We have the engagement layer and thinking how do we get the activity around it? How do we get uh, build a healthy community around it? How do we onboard people into that community? Next strung out is sort of on the discovery side. How do we amplify this into the world and just let them know? Uh, and we also have outreach and operations as sort of strategic partnership building and thinking through, you know, like you were just mentioning with the kind of organizations we could be connecting with. Uh, and I know one of the things that uh, we'll be reviewing at some point soon is what is our actual concrete outreach plan and uh, going into having formal direction rather than just being reactionary there and uh, managing both sides of it. But it's it's interesting to think how I feel like at this point at SCURF, there is the the core operational part, which is still involves a lot of experimentation and uh, exploring and building. And we also kind of have this uh, special projects bucket on the side where it's sort of new activities that we are uh, excitedly yet cautiously approaching because we think that they can deeply enhance what we're trying to build in terms of our core operations here while also recognizing these are huge endeavors. And uh, I'm sure we might zoom into these, but, you know, one being around uh, building an open peer review process for independent researchers where peer reviewers are actually compensated for their time. Or what does building a uh, decentralized research center around DAOs and governance mean and look like? Or at least how do we help fill in those gaps between this uh, very emerging and right now tremendously active DAO and governance research space, which has just been exploding? Or how do we actually build relationships in DSI, kind of connecting all these groups, looking at research, whether it's specific in the Web3 domain or, you know, looking at uh, just the hard sciences or kind of any scientific topic uh, and trying to think simultaneously how do we build bridges to the meta research community? Because uh, we're not the first people to think about peer review, nor is anyone in DSI. There's you know, been groups doing this for decades, and we want to make sure to learn from everyone and not just be blind to, oh, well, if you're not using Web3 tooling, it's irrelevant. It's no, no, no. We have much to learn from anyone who's thought about these problems before. Yeah, that's definitely part of the challenge. And it also, it's the fact that we're thinking about uh, what is the nature of uh, open peer review and how can we help uh, the ecosystem uh, frame that up for themselves and identify the challenges. It speaks to the, the rapid maturity of the space and, and the need for SCURF to remain reactive. And so six to 12 months ago, um, I probably wouldn't have believed anybody to say that the, the space would have been mature enough to actually require this, this type of an infrastructure uh, at this point. But uh, crypto moves fast, and we are uh, engaging with so many different actors all over the space, from from researchers to publishers to faculties to industry actors. That um, there is a tremendous need. It, it has become blindingly obvious that there is a tremendous need for um, offering a, a service, or at least framing up what a service might look like for open peer review, and then engaging with the ecosystem to arrive at what. The requirements are and then what it would actually look like this is a tremendous opportunity to sort of fill in one of these academic slash crypto primitives that the space or the or even the DSI space is going to require in order to sort of bootstrap the rest of the things that are going on around us so this is one of those uh, really important pivot points that we're we're lucky enough to be in a position to help out with Absolutely. And that, uh, I think, leads nicely to, I know we, we got a few questions from some teammates and, and community members, so I just want to make sure to, to pepper at least some of those in there. But one that came up was, uh, what is the most pressing problem space in Web3 that SCURF is not yet in a position to be able to facilitate, <laughs> but that we should be building yeah. towards entering in the near future? Yeah, that is actually a very spicy question. I think you need to wing this one. So Here's, here's part of the challenge, I think, is that um, the scope of challenges ahead of us is so wide ranging that picking which challenge to do first is key um, and which ones we can contribute directly to um, coordinating on or which ones are going to be involved just purely facilitating, like helping, finding the actors in the space that are better able to do it, uh, getting them with other stakeholders and then providing uh, whatever resources we can to facilitate those things. And so um, this, this yeah, maybe it does come back to, I hope this isn't a dodge, but we need to be reactive to the needs of the space and the maturity of the space and the actors and the stakeholders that begin to arrive in this space. And um, trying to anticipate that far ahead about where Web3 needs to be um, is enormously challenging. Futurism is a notoriously 
uh, fraught with peril. Um, not a lot of people have a very good track record there. Um, in the crypto space, um, it moves so quickly that frequently it's hard to tell uh, as a collective, uh, hard to understand what just happened or what even happened six months ago. Sometimes it takes a while to sort all this stuff out. So as far as SCURF goes, I think that our major challenge right now is to close the loop on uh, this reciprocal relationship between industry and academia that we've been talking about for a long time. We've, uh, I use a, well, maybe this is too spicy for an interview, but I'll come out and say it anyways, is that um, engaging with academia is the biggest lift. Uh, the, there's uh, a lot of misconceptions about what the blockchain space is all about. There are lots of painfully accurate conceptions about what the blockchain space is all about. There's work that the blockchain ecosystem needs to do, uh, the crypto ecosystem needs to do, in order to uh, convey a sense of legitimacy or uh, maturity, I suppose. Um, and crypto plus academia has a four or five year history and not all of it has been great. <laughs> and so when we're engaging with academics, primarily uh, one of our, our major challenges is to convey the sense of seriousness and legitimacy and the capacity to execute. We need to build relationships in this salted earth of uh, projects that might have come before us and also figure out how do we translate this new and vibrant and vaguely anarchic world of crypto and try to figure out where the bridges and the connection points are between academia. And we spent a year and a half doing that with uh, far greater success than I probably would have predicted. Um, the, it shows us, at least shows me personally that the timing was right. Uh, there's enormous uh, demographic in academia that is willing to experiment or to uh, approach uh, the crypto space with um, cautious optimism, I suppose. And so that was one of our greatest achievements over the last year is creating these deep relationships with a lot of very uh, large academic institutions. To close that loop though, um, we're in a position now where we can begin connecting actors from universities in Australia that are focusing on ethnography with uh, DAOs in you know Latin America that are trying to figure out how to polish up their coordination mechanisms to speak to their own specific uh, demographics. That kind of uh, collaboration is where we see, you know, frankly, the magic it happens when we connect deep thinkers in academia, literally in a room or uh, in it within a framework or a grants program or a series of meetings or a panel with industry actors that are literally on the ground implementing the things that the academics have been thinking about. And we can watch that that interplay of ideas and, and learning and challenges, and then identify the key aspects of that kind of relationship and then figure out what comes after that. Like what is the next step to implement something or to uh, do stage two of the research? That is a long-winded way of saying that this is the uh, the, the next challenge that SCURF is, is, is facing is closing this loop between industry and academia, uh, figuring out what kind of uh, magical chemistry happens when that occurs, and then facilitating the outputs of that. Um, and this is where we come back to the experimentation phase, so finding out what people need and then uh, supporting that is the next stage after that. Yeah, and just to add to that, I mean, I think in a number of conversations that we, we've, I know we've both been having uh, both together and separately with other folks, uh, it's very apparent how much of a need there is for both research facilitation between all the actors in the space, as well as how do you actually help create the environment that maximizes the probability that some research output translates into an actionable outcome within various organizations. And I know the latter of the two of that actionable angle, you know, since I joined SCURF, that's always been a, hey, we're not doing things just for the sake of research. We're doing it for the sake of actionable outcomes on the back of research. And how do we actually make positive change happen? And I think the whole idea of in a, a, how do we keep experimenting to do that better? But how do we, especially in the current landscape where, you know, as of mid-March 2022, it seems that uh, anyone who's heard the word DAO for more than a year is somehow officially a, a DAO expert and a leading consultant in the DAO space. And, you know, all of a sudden there's uh, dozens of organizations that are popping up, claiming up to do DAO research. And uh, I know we're connected to, to a dozen or two that are, that are genuinely doing amazing work, but the lack of coordination, and it makes 
sense just because everyone is so busy with the work that they're actually doing, but who actually helps, uh, you know, like you were saying with the example at East Denver of like, hey, you and those per the, that other group over there, y'all are doing essentially the same thing with potentially a slightly different twist. You should at least talk to each other and be aware of each other's projects. And I think kind of going from trying to just do the facilitation and just do more of that actionable translation into what does it look like when these actually come together. Uh, and, you know, that kind of comes back to this whole idea of this large DAO research project that we want to support. Um, yeah, that's one that we even need to ramp up towards and get ready for. And that's going to be its own, I keep saying it's its own, very exciting, but still a monstrosity of a challenge, uh, just given how many moving parts there are, how many people, personalities, egos, etc. And to figure out how to add that kind of catalytic energy going from thought output to actionable uh, outcomes of some kind is still elusive in its own right and something we continuously try to get closer and closer to having an answer of how to do that better. That's part of the vibrancy or the excitement that I think, or at least I personally feel in this space is that there's there's no other industry that you can consider um, that is inventing itself as it goes along. And it is this vibrant and as, sort of as an example what is it, six years ago, uh, joining MakerDAO. And then at some point, a few months afterwards, asking, well, hold on, what is the DAO part, though? What does that actually mean? And then we're all, oh, well, I'm not exactly sure. What does that mean? Um, and here we are six years later. Uh, get, we're narrowing in on it, but I'm not really sure I've seen the definitive definition of what a DAO actually is or really uh, a, a clear example that somebody can point me to. And so that's that's not an indictment. That's that's fascinating. That's uh, That presents an opportunity that, you know, People are unlikely to experience at this scope uh, again, possibly, or maybe hopefully, who knows? <laughs> That's a different discussion. But if we can all figure out, if, if SCURF can, can take a role in bringing all the actors and providing some clarity and some sense making uh, to some of these larger questions, then I feel like we've done something important. Um, we don't need to come up with the answer and give the answer to the world of what a DAO is. That's not our role, but um, being a part of the process where the ecosystem has begun to come up with some standards or some some uh, categories or whatever around what DAOs could mean or what collective action could mean or what, uh, what privacy means or what the implement, implications of that is. Um, there's crypto plus X is, is almost crypto plus anything, but there's, there's a wide range of activities that um, are opportunities for us to help out the space. And I, I think that that, well, actually, I don't want to, change topics here but there's something to consider too is that um one of one of the special things that scurf kind of brings to the space is the fact that we don't have that revenue model that we are agnostic and uh we're chain agnostic project agnostic region agnostic we have no horses in this race um uh, my, well, yeah, my new euphemism is but we are very invested in ensuring that race horses continue and so our races continue so we want to support this discovery process um, and that, that gives us an opportunity to bring uh, supporting infrastructure uh, and organizational infrastructure and platform infrastructure um, in an agnostic manner to anybody who wishes to participate. And so a lot of these uh, very uh, nascent organizations, which are doing deep dives into the philosophy uh, behind some aspect of crypto, don't necessarily have all of the infrastructure and the resources in place to fully explore those things on their own or connect with the other players that could also contribute. And, uh, having the opportunity to do that for the space uh, at SCURF, I think, is tremendously important and rewarding. Absolutely, yeah. And I also want to jump to one of the questions that we got from Loretta in terms of what are some of our reach goals at SCURF? And how do we envision some kind of pathways in getting towards those reach goals? That's another tough one. And maybe I'm going to put you on the spot and find out what your answer to this question is, because mine is going to be um, unsatisfying. Uh, our, our reach, so we, we've thought about this a lot internally. So how do we actually measure success when our... Uh, our mission is sort of squishy. It's, it's kind of ill-defined. We want things to be better. We want Web3 to be to get smarter faster than it would have in our absence. Um, and so what does that actually mean? What does that actually look like? If we were building widgets, I would say, well, the, the widgets are more efficient or we produce more widgets, 36% more widgets next year. It's easy. Um, if we're trying to 
make things better or help facilitate or support or incentivize or grant um, and doing it in a way that is reactive to the needs of the system or the ecosystem and as the ecosystem evolves is very difficult to point to a specific uh, outcome. So I tend to fall back on this idea of notable wins. Um, if we can look back in six months and say to ourselves that this uh, manifesto that has inflamed the space it was largely facilitated or partially facilitated by SCURF wouldn't have happened if we weren't there to help out. That is a huge win for me. Uh, whether anybody else knows it or not doesn't really matter. But um, or a team of researchers were funded that we that we funded them to do something that actually improved this project or this area of expertise or this problem space, um, and we. Uh, helped kick off those careers or supported or mentored those individuals into greater successes. Those are the notable wins, but trying to identify them ahead of time is a super tough one. Um, so maybe if I had to be forced to come up with some, I would like to have a platform, uh, a forum where uh, civil, intelligent, lively conversation happens around novel and actionable and useful research in the space. Industry actors are excited about the things they find there. Researchers are excited to have the opportunity to contribute, that we've helped um, facilitate a framework or an ecosystem or DAOs or something that allows independent researchers to uh, enjoy some of the benefits of peer review that they might not have access to outside of the traditional academic world. Uh, that would be great, that we um, have facilitated one or more projects um, and, and given them the resources that they need to achieve greater clarity around uh, uh, any one of the eight major categories that we're looking at from auditing security to governance mechanism design to uh, privacy to uh, uh, what have you that, that we've we've def we've helped push the space forward in a way that people can look back and go oh yeah things are better now but the, the, like I said I, I can't point to um, 36 percent more efficient widgets because it's it's beyond my comfort zone to predict what the future might hold but maybe eugene is comfortable in doing it so what do you think success 36 percent more efficient knowledge no. um yeah go. i think it's 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 an interesting one to think about for me one of the elements that you were kind of alluding to and touching on that gets me really excited is how do we create a stronger link between problem generation and the potential problem solvers or problem statement generation, not just generating problems, <laughs> problem statement generation and no, uh, connecting with problems. the right set of stuff. Yeah, I mean, if that was our goal, we, we, we should be playing a whole different game. That would, be, that would be fun, but <laughs> disastrous. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think the idea of Right. If you look at different uh, knowledge areas now or you know, take any educational discipline of computer science or engineering or, you know, whatever subset, there are different forms of how the most pressing problems in the space get surfaced or shared. And rarely is it genuinely coordinated across the entire space. And, you know, in certain disciplines, it'll be a certain actor organizes a certain convening and outputs a, a, a research statement white paper that they share with the NSF and government funding agencies or things like that, uh, or some don't domains are so small that people just all know each other. And it's like, well, call those five people and then you got everyone you need to talk to because there's only 500 of us on the whole planet. Um, and I think it's interesting to try to create from the event perspective, from the tooling perspective, and from the community perspective, which community and culture are inherently deeply linked. But how do you across these different areas realize how to generate problems and then get those problems into the hands of people who have the chance or uh, the capability and skills to solve them while also connecting them with the funders who are in the position to potentially help it scale up if if scaling is realistically feasible there. Um, and on that note, kind of being aware of where does it make sense to scale versus where do things need to stay very small? And if anything, you keep replicating small communities around very focused groups instead of trying to get, you know, like the one master research group to solve all research problems globally, like that would be a disaster. Uh, so that that's another one that comes to mind in terms of a, an exciting thing that we will hopefully get to play our part in making better. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of interesting tensions here. One of the major outputs of SCURF is to act as a translation layer. Uh, so as we're trying to connect individuals or groups and fa um, 
faculties and, and industry together is um, we kind of have three different levels of translation happening. We need to to understand the expectations and the paradigms in the academic world and speak a language that they can kind of understand. We need to understand um, the, the outputs and the expectations of industry. And we also need to understand how crypto puts its own special, special spin on these things without having one of these three areas uh, drown out the others. And we also discover that there's different expectations. And so in academia, uh, it's there, there's an environment there that promotes diligence and deep thinking and uh, the, the academia lives in a different temporal reality than industry does where you can think about something for months or years uh, and then once you come to some conclusions you're satisfied with and you can publish in industry uh, potentially you have three weeks to figure out a solution to the problem or else you, you know, hack something together and hope for the best or you just don't do it um, so there's there's different um outputs um, and different pressures and trying to speak to the strengths of all of these groups and, and what crypto is just you know it's it's pure chaos at all times and people are just trying to figure out what's going on around them loving it but it's it's very chaotic so how do we um uh bring some more of this uh actionable uh mentality to uh the process but keep the diligence in the academic world and then figure out how we can have those two groups collaborate and then throw in the old uh, crypto or web three spin uh, where it's useful and then provide an output is a, is a constant challenge. And that's, that's a fascinating aspect for me, figuring out where the comfort zone is between all of these different demographics. And so I guess as we're getting ready to wrap up, it feels only appropriate if we also put on the actionable lens to this podcast and think of what, what is some kind of call to action for anyone who might hear this. And uh, obviously there's the element of, hey, what we're doing here is new and we still need more folks to help us build what we're trying to build. Uh, and to, yeah, feel free to reach out to us or to hop in our Discord and see what ways there are to contribute to all the exciting things we're trying to build. Uh, and yeah, I was just wondering if there were any specific calls to action that were on your mind uh, in terms of anyone who might happen to come across this. Sure. Uh, it's going to be tough um, because we've talked about a lot of foggy notions. So we want to make things better. We want to help people. We want to facilitate them. We want to connect them. We want to. Uh, so what does that actually mean? That's a good question. And so I talked about some of the experimentation. Um, if you want to know what our experiments are all about, though, um, here's some good news for you is that we're fantastically resource constrained um, as far as people go. And so we need people desperately. Um, to not only bring their ideas to the table and their projects uh, and their initiatives and let us know about them, but also to contribute to ours. And so we have grants programs. We fund original research, uh, or at least we're dipping our toes in there. We have uh, regional grants programs where we want to surface use cases and studies from uh, areas of the world that uh, where people are actually doing blockchain. Uh, they're actually needed, which is, you know, provide some interesting uh, results. We need to know about that stuff. We have, uh, we're looking for researchers, and, uh, independent researchers to join us uh, and help us uh, evaluate and surface uh, fascinating research in the space, summarize it and then bring it back to the ecosystem and also to engage with it publicly. So we are doing, or, or trying to understand the notion of what open peer review looks like. And so we need peer reviewers in the space to provide us with some insight. We need industry to tell us what they are looking for or what independent research is looking for. Um, lots of stakeholders there. Um, we uh, we need project managers. We need team leads. So, if you're interested in crypto and Web three, you have an academic bent to uh, your thinking or a history with academia. You're energized by some of the problems that we're thinking about. Please join us in the chat. Um, I guarantee we'll find a space for you uh, fairly rapidly. Uh, maybe you should add on too, because as an, from an operations perspective, what, what do you think that we should be? Uh, people's takeaway should be here. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, as we were talking about in our ops meeting this morning, the, the the hiring side is a tremendous priority for us. Uh, you know, I think the we're we're actively working on uh, tinkering with our community structure, how we use our community call, the nature of onboarding here, uh, and you know, talk to any uh, decentralized environment. Onboarding is a persistent challenge, given how quickly the space is moving, how fast things are changing. So, I mean. Uh, massive plus one to all of that, what you said on the resourcing side, you know, I think even for 
for folks who uh, might not be interested in, in either jumping in, in in a more committed kind of fashion, but are just interested in the topics of uh, how to improve research, how to improve review. We're just very happy to always hear your feedback. Uh, we'll make sure to post a link to our project board uh, in the show notes of this as well. Uh, that way you can actually just jump in our GitHub and see all the things that are on the move for us right now and not just have to talk to someone on the team and hear what our perspective is in general because we use GitHub for our actual project management. So you can just get a glimpse of what's going on internally at any given point. And yeah, I mean, operationally, I think one of the big things is we try to figure out how to provide more value on the actionable, on converting research to actionable outcomes. If you work in industry and you are seeing persistent problems or experiencing persistent problems that you want more researchers paying attention to, please highlight that to us. Uh, and, you know, we're not asking to uh, to contribute to any funds or anything like that. We're in a position, fortunately, where uh, we are able to support with granting. So if anything, we just need to have more directions to be sent in to say, hey, here's an area of problems that the industry is experiencing. Help us experiment around how we can solve those problems more quickly. And that's exactly the kind of value we're trying to provide to the, to the ecosystem in the Web3 space. So yeah, whether you're looking for roles yourself, you just want to provide some feedback, or you think you have tangible problems that need to be solved, uh, please make sure to put that on our radar and we will be greatly appreciative of it. Well said. Yeah. Perfect. And I think that's a, a good place for us to wrap up for the day. And so, yeah, as always, pleasure chatting, Rich. And yeah, we'll have more information on how to connect with uh, both of us and Scurf in the show notes. So I hope you enjoy the rest of your day wherever you are in the world. All right, thanks a lot.